how that God initially revealed it orally and then it began to be committed to writing and then ultimately it was all collected together into the book we call the Bible. Uh, tonight we're going to kind of expand on that a little bit and talk about inspiration, the doctrine of inspiration. We say all the time, the Bible's inspired, the Bible's inspired, but I wonder if you've really thought about everything that's involved, the full meaning, the full definition of inspiration. So that's what we're going to be talking about. And we'll start off here with a definition, two words that are crucial, the word revelation and the word inspiration. Uh, both of those have to do with, with the Bible. Revelation is something divulged, disclosed, made known, or exposed. If you uh, pull the blanket off your feet, there's been a revelation of your feet. So that's basically the idea. You're, you're pulling the blanket back, you're pulling the curtain back, you're divulging, disclosing, revealing, exposing, or making known something. Uh, this word uh, is interesting because a lot of times in Scripture it's connected with the word mystery. Uh, the Bible, in fact, we read that last night in Ephesians 3, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. That's Ephesians 3.3. 3. Uh, and, and so the word mystery in the New Testament takes on a new connotation. We always think of a mystery as being something hidden. Uh, but in the New Testament, the word mystery takes on the connotation of that which was hidden is now disclosed. And every time you see the word mystery in the New Testament, somewhere close by you'll see revealed, made known, manifested, or something like that. Because what was a mystery is no longer a mystery. And so the Bible is described as a revelation. In Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26, Paul uses that word and talks about how this was an eternal plan of God. He says, Now, uh, to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. There's those two words linked together, revelation and mystery. The revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Notice that, was kept secret, verse 26, but now, not a secret anymore, now has been made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures has been made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. And so you see the ideal that God had this everlasting plan, this eternal mystery that has now been revealed. Uh, and, and then the second word that's important for us to understand is the word inspiration. I forget where I first found this uh, definition. I think I found it in a book written by uh, uh, Batsel Barrett Baxter. He was a preacher from among the, the liberals. Uh, he's, he's been dead for several years now, but somewhere in one of his books, he came up with this definition, and I liked it. Uh, I think it's a pretty good definition. Uh, if you look up inspiration in the dictionary, you're not going to find that. But I think that accurately describes what the Bible talks about when it speaks of inspiration. The supernatural influence exerted on the sacred writers by the Spirit of God by reason of which their writings are given divine trustworthiness. Now, I may be mistaken, but I think the word inspiration is only used once in the Bible. Uh, I may be wrong, and maybe you know of another passage. The only one I can think of is 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And in fact, uh, in, in English, inspiration of God, that actually comes from one single word in the Greek, theonoustos, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, theos being God, and noustos meaning breathe or or, or utter, uttered is the idea of God breathe because when you speak you're breathing and so that's where that figure of speech comes from and so the idea of God breathe uh, but that's basically describing what's happening here you have the sacred writers uh, that is the, pro the apostles and the prophets uh, of the Old and New Testaments you have the sacred writers and then there's an influence exerted on them and that influence is supernatural it's not that, that some human is dictating things to them but it's supernatural. What, what does the word supernatural mean? Uh, yes, above and beyond. And God is supernatural. He's a supernatural being. He, he exists above and beyond nature and outside the context of nature. He made nature. He exists outside of it, independent of it. And so he's supernatural. And he influenced the sacred writers by means of the Spirit of God. God is three persons and the Holy Spirit, his job was revealer, teacher. And so when we speak of the inspiration, we're talking about that influence exerted on the writers. And because of that influence, that is by reason of which, their writings are given divine trustworthiness. In other words, because God was involved in the revealing of Scripture, we can trust it. If you can't believe God, you can't believe anybody. 
And so because God exerted this influence, the scriptures are to be trusted. I can trust what it says about creation. I can trust what it says about Jonah. I can trust what it says about Jesus and the resurrection because God himself, this wasn't a story concocted by men. This is, this is the idea of the doctrine of inspiration. Now there's a lot of details that come into play and that's what we're gonna spend the rest of the class talking about. First of all, we're going to be talking about that. When we, when we talk about inspiration, what we're saying is that the scriptures were superintended by God. He didn't just turn these men loose and say, write whatever you want. Uh, I'd like to see what you can come up with. I'd like to see what your creative energies can produce. That's not what happened. Uh, God superintended the whole process. Let's read. Somebody read for us uh, 2 Peter uh, uh, 1, verses 20 and 21. night we looked at this verse and we looked at it from the standpoint of the the phrase private interpretation and you remember we made the point last night that's not talking about the reader of scripture but the writer of scripture uh, everybody who reads scripture interprets it that's just an unavoidable thing if you're going to understand what it says you're going to interpret it so he's not saying here as, as many have tried to make it say that you can't interpret the bible everybody interprets the bible uh, but he's talking about the person who wrote it. And, and you can see that clearly in the next verse. For, that's his explanation. This is why it's not a private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man. He's talking about where scripture came from. The person who wrote it. Not the person who read it or reads it. But the person who wrote it. Prophecy never came by the will of man. Tonight we're going to focus on this other phrase in verse 21 though. He says, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That expression moved uh, by the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't of, of the writer's private interpretation, but instead they, these writers were moved by the Holy Spirit. The word moved uh, in the Greek language means to be carried about by an outside force. Uh, you can look up in the sky and you can see how the clouds are moved through the sky. What moves them? The winds, yeah. The winds move them. And so you can see that. Uh, you can see uh, how if you put a, a toy boat, if you, you know how you used to play when you were kids, and you'd have these mud puddles, and they'd be flowing down the street, and you could put a little toy boat up here, and it would float in the water, and it would go right down, the, and it's being moved. That little boat's being, what's moving it? The flow of the water. The outside force in that case is the flow of the water. The outside force that moves the winds, or moves the clouds, is the wind. And he's saying here there was an outside force that moved the writers of Scripture, that moved them and guided them and told them where to go and what to say and how to say it. So they're being moved by what? The Holy Spirit. So this is the first peg you want to nail down when you talk about the doctrine of inspiration. Uh, people today, they use the word inspiration in different ways, and that's not an illegitimate use legitimate to use it that way we talk about an artist being inspired uh, but that's not the way it's being used here we're not talking about this artist having this great idea or this great creativity but the biblical doctrine of inspiration suggests that God is moving and guiding and directing the writers and telling them what to say and how to say it so that's the first peg you nail down the second thing and I think this is very important inspiration is verbal. God didn't just plant the ideals in their minds, but he gave them the very words. And we talked about that last Sunday a little bit. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 2. What'd you say, Charles? Yeah, let's not read all that. I, I, don't, I don't think I want to take the time to go through all of that. Let's read verses um, uh, 11 through 13. In this section that was just read, 
he starts off with an illustration in verse 11. What man knows the things of a man? Who here in the audience, and I think, I know you do, has a new, you have a new American Standard? Read verse 11 in your new American Standard version. Okay. The thoughts, the thoughts. Now that's not literal. Literally, it's the things. But that's very accurate. He's talking about the fact that you don't know what's going on inside another man's head. Who knows the things or the thoughts of a man? You don't know what's going on in his head. The only one who knows that is that man, okay? That's an illustration. Even so, just like you don't know what's going on in another man's head, even so, the things or the thoughts of God knows no one except the Spirit of God. Just like I can't read your mind, I sure can't read God's mind, okay? And so, that's why it was called a mystery. We didn't know. Verse 12, something's changed. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who's from God. Who's the we here? Anybody remember? The apostles. We talked about that on Sunday. The apostles. They received the Holy Spirit. When was that? The, the Pentecost. And the reason was that they might know. That's the revelation. We talked about revelation earlier. That's the revealing or the disclosing or the making known. We receive the Holy Spirit so that he could make known to us these things. Verse 13, these things we speak. So they took that information. The Holy Spirit came upon them, revealed and disclosed things to them, and then they spoke. Okay, These things we speak, now watch this, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. That's my, The word words there is critical. It's not the words that men came up with. That's what Peter was saying in, in 2, or 2 Peter 1.20. Not in the, uh, the words of man's wisdom, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. But the, the operative word there is words. The very words themselves were given by God. And so the doctrine of inspiration that's revealed in the Bible is not just that God put the ideals in their head, but that God gave them the very words. So... When Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, and Mark was inspired to write that, he wrote exactly what Jesus said in the way Jesus wanted it said. And, the, and the, that, that's critical because people today like to move those words around, don't they? People today like to say, he that believeth is saved and shall be baptized if he wants to. But that's not what the words say. The words say, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So the words are critical. God gave those words, and he gave them directly to the apostles that they could speak them and, of course, eventually write them down. But they could speak them and write them down just exactly the way God wanted them. So the doctrine of inspiration in, involves verbal words. It also involves plenary inspiration. Anybody know what that word means? I, I'll bet the attorney knows what plenary. I might not mean saying that right. Is it plenary or plenary? Say it again. Plenary. I said it wrong. Plenary. What does that mean? The whole thing. Yeah. It, it has to do with the whole thing. And so when, when we talk about the, the plenary inspiration of the scriptures, we're talking about the whole thing is inspired. Not just the words in red. And that's the way some people look at the Bible. Well, I don't care what Paul said. I want to know what Jesus said. That's why I got me a red letter edition. I don't want one of them black letter editions. I want a red letter edition because I want to know what Jesus said. I don't care what Paul said. I don't care what Peter said. And I don't care what John said. I want to know what Jesus said. So I look at the red letters because those are the words of the Lord. And what we're saying here is that conclusion is incorrect. That was an editing decision. Some editor somewhere said, you know, it would be kind of neat if we just took the words of Jesus and made them red. And I don't have a big beef with that. I kind of like it. But I know this, and you should know it too, that those red letters aren't any more precious than the black ones. They're all the same. And so when we speak of plenary inspiration, we're talking about fully from one end to the other. Yes. He's just, yeah, he's just the mouthpiece or the scribe, as you said. Uh, and so we're, we're saying everything from one end to the other. And that's what 2 Timothy 3, 16 affirms. Some scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture. It's not, he didn't say, the red letter portions are given by inspiration of God. 
the words of Jesus himself are given by inspiration of God. The rest of it, you can kind of do what you want with. That's not what he said. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So the whole shebang from Genesis to Revelation, the whole thing from one end to the other is inspired. So what we're doing here is building the doctrine of the inspiration of scripture. What does it mean? When you hear me stand up here and say the Bible's inspired, these are the things I'm talking about. I'm saying all of these things, and I'm affirming all of these things. Uh, and, and I think it's good for us to just stop and, and analyze that, tear it down, and analyze all the components of inspiration. There's also this ideal of selective inspiration. We said last night, we touched on it a little bit last night, uh, truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, John 20, verse 30. You mean John left some stuff out? Yeah. So did Paul. Paul said, I wrote you in my epistle not, not to company with fornicators, 1 Corinthians 5, 9, but I don't know where he wrote that. We don't have that letter. It's gone. Okay? So there was a selective process. I want this in the Bible. I don't want that. I want this, and I don't want that. What does Deuteronomy 29, 29 say? There are secret things, and there are revealed things. There are things you're not going to know the answer to in this life. God didn't give them. He just didn't, he just didn't tell us. He didn't think, uh, and not to sound rude, but he basically said, none of your business. Okay? <laughs> if I want you to know, I told you. But I didn't tell you because I didn't want you to know. I didn't think it was important for you to know. Okay? So there are secret things, and there are things that are revealed. And when you die, there's going to be secret things. Now, you may know them when you get over yonder if God chooses to tell you. But right now, you're not going to know them, Dale. Yeah. yeah you know, and we, get, we get caught up in these questions. Well, why did Nicodemus come to Jesus by night? I don't know. Was he afraid of the Jews? Maybe. It makes as good a sense as any. Uh, may, maybe that was it. Maybe it was. Maybe that was the only time he had. Maybe he worked all day long. Had to work. Use daylight for working. Run behind a plow all day long. <laughs> and then come at night because that's when he can't plow. I don't know why he came to Jesus. But, but people get caught up in things like this. That, that don't amount to a hill of beans. Don't matter. Have nothing to do with going to heaven. But God was very selective. And that's, that's one of the interesting, and I think it's a proof of inspiration, by the way, that God didn't see fit to give us all the details. When we write stuff, man, we write everything. i got to get all this deep, get this detail, get that fact, bring this in, bring that in. God says, no, I want this said. Let's leave that out. I want this taught. I want, let's leave this other thing out. I want to give you what you need. So God was very selective. There are things that are secret that we're not going to know in this life. And then there are things that are revealed. So the doctrine of inspiration talks about these limitations that God placed upon himself. Can you imagine how big the Bible would be? You know, it said many other signs did Jesus. If it recorded all of his signs, if it recorded every word he ever said, if it recorded every action that he took from the time that he woke up his eyes in the morning until the time he pillowed his head at night, every day for 33 years, how big would the Bible be? And that's just the Gospels. <laughs> We haven't got any. So God was very selective. This is what you need to know. You don't need to know that. And, he, and he, So the doctrine of inspiration is God guiding it, superintending it, and selecting those things that we need to know. Inspiration also suggests that the Scripture is infallible. What's John 17, 17 say? By thy truth. What's the opposite of truth? falsehood the truth and error truth and falsehood thy word is falsehood no thy word is truth that excludes error so God's word is infallible now does God's word record sins sure it does it records sins like Adam and Eve it records sins like what David did uh, records sins of uh, Saul of Tarsus when he's persecuting Christians it records it, but here's the point. You can bank that those things happened. The Bible says David committed adultery with Bathsheba. 
He did. He didn't, God didn't lie about that. God didn't make that up to smear David's name. That's a fact. Uh, when God recorded that Paul persecuted Christians, you can bank on that's true. That's true. It, it, it wasn't made up to besmirch his, his name. That's true. And so you can count on every statement in the Bible. It's true. Now, people today, they want to weigh in the balances. They want to look at that and say, I just can't bring myself to believe in six days of creation. I can't bring myself to believe that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish and survived. I just can't believe that. I can't believe that the entire world was covered with a flood. And they're judging, first of all, passing judgment on events they've never seen and could not prove or disprove if their life depended on it. The only testimony they have is this right here. And it's not our place. We had a sermon a while back on absolute authority. It's not our place to sit in judgment on God's word. Did I see a hand? Was it Dale? Yeah. And, and generally uh, speaking, and I say that just because there might be some exception somewhere I'm not aware of, but generally speaking, there was a, the reason behind that was sin of some kind, whether it was idolatry or immorality, whatever it was. God is, it was using one day and still does it today, uses one nation to bring judgment on another, still does that today. And uh, we may not understand his long-term plans, his long-term goals in regard to those things, but know this, he knows what they are. He knows what those plans are, what those goals are. Uh, but the things that God does and the things that God says, particularly in regard to the lesson, is, is infallible. So if God says the world was made in six days, you can bank on it, it was. If God says what God has joined together, let not man put asunder, you can bank on it. That's the way it is. And no amount of, of whining and no amount of, well, I don't think that's fair. Nothing like that is going to change one thing about what God said. He said what he said. And so it's infallible. When Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, that's what he meant. It's infallible. That's true. People say, well, I don't think that's right. Because Paul said over here, you're saved by grace through faith. Yeah, he sure did, and I don't deny it. But he also said over here, he that believeth is baptized shall be saved. Now, you can't take this and nullify that. They're both true. They're both true. And what people want to do is take this scripture and nullify that scripture. I'll take this salvation by grace through faith, and that nullifies every passage on baptism. Sorry, it doesn't. They're all true. It is by faith. i got to believe. It is by grace. Jesus provided, or God provided Jesus on the cross. That's grace. It is by being baptized because Jesus said so. It's all true. All of it. Questions, comments up to this point? Okay. Authoritative. The authoritativeness of it. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, said, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write to you are the suggestions of the Lord. Commandments. So, and, and I think that touches on something that's very important with a lot of religious people today. They see the Bible as sort of a generalized God. We don't really have to follow it to the letter. We don't really have to do everything it says. We can kind of modify it. Well, this is the 21st century. We can kind of modify things and change things around. And the Bible's just sort of an a, a overarching guide. That's not the picture you see in the Bible. The things that I write to you are not the suggestions of the Lord. The things that I write to you are not just pertinent in the first century. The things that I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. And we can just kind of branch off of that for just a moment into the idea of how authority is expressed, how, how, how authority is expressed. Authority can be expressed by means of direct commandments. Go, preach the gospel, direct commandments, okay? Authority can be expressed by examples. Look what the churches of, he said, as I gave order to the churches of Galatia, 
even so do ye. See that? Now, he's expressing some authority there. That's an authoritative statement. In fact, he says, as I gave order, okay? As I gave order to the churches of Galatia. So that's an authoritative statement, but he's using an example. He said, look what I told them to do, and you do exactly the same thing. And, and so we use that same example today. If the churches of Galatia were laying by on the first day of the week for the saints, and the church at Corinth could lay by and store on the first day of the week, then the church at Fishers can do the same thing. I know that's right. I don't know that it's right for us to go out here and have a car wash and raise money. We need money. Pay this building off. Let's go have us a car wash. I don't have any scripture for that, you see? And so the doctrine of inspiration, when we say the Bible's inspired, we're asserting also, because God was the guiding force behind it, the superintending force behind it, we're saying that what he says here is authoritative, that we have to do what the book says. We have to do what the Bible says. Now, I was talking about modifying it. Is, is there a sense in which, and I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I cover all my bases here, is there a sense in which things can be modified for the times? I'm not hearing any answers. Sure. Go ahead, Randy. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And this goes back to well, something else we were saying on Sunday. This effort. There are people who don't have the effort. I don't want to know the truth. And I don't want to, I don't want to put the effort for it. The effort. We have to learn to distinguish between that which is essential, that which is authoritative, which must be done, taking the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, singing without the aid of instrumental music, baptism, for the remission of sins by means of immersion. These are things that are essential, that are authoritative. Where am I going to baptize you? That's a non-issue, okay? That's a non-issue. What, as Randy said, what time of day are we going to take the Lord's Supper? 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the afternoon? That is left to us to decide. And so there are ways in which certain things can be modified for the times, Al. Yes. 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 Right. Precisely. As long as we stay within the bounds of Scripture, we're, we're safe. And so, and I bring that up because sometimes people will say, well, they didn't have church buildings in the Bible. Well, that's true. They didn't. But as Randy was saying, the meeting place is really not is not an issue. It's not a matter of the authoritative will of God. You can meet down by the riverside, meet in your living room. You can meet right out here in the parking lot. Uh, you can meet any place, or you can erect a building. Yes, Mallory. And, that, and, that, and, that, and that's a great point. That, that brings in the, the idea of the completeness. You need to look at the whole message. Is there a portion of the message that talks about these gifts and these revelations? Yes. But if you look at the total message, it says now that work is done. And now we have it all in, in the book. So we don't have men speaking in tongues and inspired and things like that. So yeah, that, that's another side of that. Very great point. Anything else? Okay. Also, we're talking about how the, the Bible was attested, that there, that there was a testimony, that there was a witness to the Scripture. This is important because I, I can recall another book, two or three other books that claim to be inspired of God. The Bible claims to be inspired of God, but the Book of Mormon does too. And... The Quran does too. They claim to be inspired of God. Anybody can come along and say, I wrote a book from God. God gave me, that's what Joseph Smith did. God gave me this. I found these golden plates up there, way up in the up, up northern part of New York up there. I found these golden plates and I was enabled to translate them 
And now we have the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. But I can't recall reading anywhere about a single miracle that Joseph Smith did, can you? See, that's, that's, that's a difference, isn't it? The Bible is backed up, sealed, notarized by miracles. And that, that's what sets it apart. The greatest miracle of all is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Everything, as far as I'm concerned, everything in our faith rests on that. You want to talk about evidences? Look into the resurrection of Jesus. If that's a fraud, your whole faith is a fraud, you may as well throw this in the garbage. Go home. Okay. But if the resurrection of Jesus be a fact, then Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Savior. Everything he said was true. Everything he said about the Bible is true. So to me, that's the ultimate miracle right there. That, that right there proves the whole thing or disproves it. Paul said it. You know, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You're still in your sins. And so God backed up his message and backed up his messengers with signs and wonders. Let's look at Mark 16, 19, 20. We looked at him a little bit last night. And there's other passages we could bring to bear on this. Somebody, I'm still flipping pages. If you've got it, go ahead and read it. did so through the signs. So the signs are God's notary seal. That's my message. That's mine. I put my stamp on it. And, and that was his notary seal. And the people who were there, the witnesses, the apostles, have recorded these things for us. Now, yeah, yeah the bottom line is you either believe their testimony or you don't. That's true. You either believe what Paul wrote or you don't. Randy, sorry, I didn't see you. than enough, well more than enough to establish the fact, the historical fact of the resurrection. Okay, uh, Jeff. Yes. Yeah, that, that brings up my next point. Exactly right. Jude 3. Jude says, contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered. So, when you affirm the inspiration of the Bible, one of the things you're affirming is that the Bible is finished. So when come, someone comes along today and says, well, Jesus said to me, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Jesus said everything he's going to say. It's, it's, it's already here. Yes. Right. So when someone comes along like Muhammad did and says, I've got a new revelation, the Quran. Sorry, no. My book says it's done. It was done 500 years before you ever came on the scene. Joseph Smith comes along in 1828 and says, I've got another testament of Jesus Christ. No, I'm sorry, no. God's already said, I'm done. I've said everything I'm going to say, and it's right there. There's not another testament of Jesus Christ. There's only one, and it's in the Bible. So anybody that comes with that, that just applies across the board to anybody. Someone comes along after the fact and says, I've got something else. No, you're, 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 you're lying. You're wrong. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you can't change it. You bring heaven's curse upon you if you try to alter it in any way. And that brings us to our last point. I heard that first tone, so we want to make sure you get this last point in here. Well, the doctrine of inspiration also, uh, I think, asserts the idea that God saw fit in his providence. A while back we studied divine providence. In his providence, he's, he, he has made it possible for the Bible to be preserved. It's been handed down to us accurately. It's been handed down to us complete and whole, without mistake, without error. And it has been preserved. People have tried to persecute the Bible out of existence. They've tried to burn it out of existence, persecute it out of existence. It's still here, and they're dead and gone. 
And if people rise up today and try to burn the Bible out of existence, they'll be dead and gone. And 100 years from now, the Bible will still be here. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And so God, that, uh, that after God has completed his book and put his stamp of authority on it and completed it, he said, I'm going to preserve it. I'm going to make sure that everybody... As long as the earth stands, everybody's going to have access to this information. It's there if you want it. There's, and that brings us back to what we were talking about Sunday. If you want to. If you want it. The information is there. It's available. It's accessible. It's understandable. This, in, in my view, is the biblical doctrine of inspiration right here. It includes and encompasses all that. When somebody stands up here and says the Bible's inspired, they're saying all of these things. That God guided them. That he gave them the words that it's inspired from one end to the other, that he chose what he wanted in the Bible and only what he wanted, that what he put in there is without error, that it is his authoritative will, that he's put a stamp of authority on it, that he's given us everything, it's completed, and that he's preserved it. This is the doctrine of inspiration. Questions, comments? Yes, Matthew. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I don't know how much time I'm going to have to get to this, but I do think in 1 Corinthians 7, he's giving his judgment. He says he is. Where was that verse? Did you, did you happen to look at it? Yeah, he says, I command, not I but the Lord. So he's commanding. I, not the Lord. Now, in that passage, what he's distinguishing between what Jesus personally said Matthew 19 to what he's been revealed here in 1 Corinthians 7 12 that I've got some additional information for you here so he's distinguishing between what Jesus personally said between uh, what he's been you know because the, the full truth wasn't given in the days of Jesus I still have many things to say to you but you can't bear them now so Paul's giving additional information I think that's the force of verse 12 and then when you come down to and I thought this is what I thought you were talking about you come 17 oh and so I ordain in all churches I would put that still under inspiration I this is uh, the Lord has called each one so let him walk and so I ordain that's still under inspiration but I was thinking more down around to uh, verse 25 I thought that's what you were referring to now concerning virgins I have no commandment from the Lord but I give judgment. I really thought that's what you were referring to. But there you can see, I think, from the context that he's shifted gears here. I give judgment. No commandment, but I'm giving you my judgment. Now, there's still something to be said for that because he's an inspired apostle, so his judgment ought to carry some weight. It, 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 you know, it may not be a commandment, but it's a judgment that ought to carry some weight. It ought, we ought to think about what he's saying here. And I thought that's what you were alluding to. Now, I tried to move through that quickly because of the time constraints, and so I don't know if I answered your question or not. Did I or did I not? Doesn't matter now. <laughs> but go ahead. Did, did I answer your question? Okay. I was going to say, dodge that one.